So we've got one dog tag, and dog tags you just don't find on excavations of the Second World War. It is a, a phenomenally rare find. So when somebody tells you they found a second one, you have real grounds to feel sceptical. And the story behind this one is even more phenomenal, if that's possible. Welcome back to the channel. We are back in Oldborn. And today we're looking at a Ministry of Defence archaeological dig on the Easy Company accommodation in Oldbourne. We're standing on the sports pitches of the village of Oldbourne in the middle of the Wil of Wiltshire countryside. And at the moment it's an idyllic scene, it's pastoral, you've got lovely houses around it. In 1943 and 4, however, this was a real shanty town. It was filled with the noise and shouts of soldiers, initially from the British Army and later on by perhaps the most famous unit of the Second World War. And I'm talking Easy Company with a 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne, better known now as Band of Brothers. There's wonderful archives from this particular unit, made famous by the book by Stephen Ambrose, and you can pick out some of the real celebrities standing in, in this field in the huts that were once behind me. In particular, we start with this one, which is uh, one of the more famous members of Easy Company on the, on the left, on the right of the image here, as Carwood Lipton, one of the sergeants, who lived in a hut in the far corner of the field. We came here with a, an excavation team in 2019, part of a, a group called Operation Nightingale that looks at recovery of military personnel project with great success and we wanted to come back and look at one of the other ranks huts and the one we chose was based on archaeological surveys called geophysical survey but also from some of the air photography that we've got and it's really well covered by the US Army Air Force in particular this hut here this is an other ranks easy company hut at the end of a path on the quadrangle of accommodation used by we think easy and fox companies some great celebrities at this one too. The hut we were looking for is this particular hut. It's like a Nissan hut. The Americans call it a Quonset hut. It's corrugated iron sheets on concrete pads with American uh, with, with iron reinforcements and glass windows with reinforcement filaments. One of the guys here, Ed Tipper, really famous member of Easy Company. Followed by another celebrity with our hut in the background. This is Bull Randleman. And finally, and I think it's my favourite one, Forrest Guth, known as the Chow Hound by his friends because he had a lot of K rations, extra ones, in pockets he'd stitched onto his, his particular uniform so he could take extra food into battle. He was very partial to a lardy cake, which is a local, local delicacy here in Wiltshire. Crucially for us, though, we've got the Quonset hut in the background. All demolished in 1953, these buildings, so now you just have a sports pitch. They were used briefly after the war to provide accommodation for people whose houses had been bombed in the cities of England, and then they were given council houses. But these are now gone, there's only one surviving, nowhere near where we're standing at the moment. But we wanted to excavate these archaeologically and see what's left of the building, and if we could see any traces of those American boys in this field below the sports pitch. The archaeology we've all done by hand just to make sure that the sports pitches aren't completely ruined so using uh, shovels and spades and uh, we've matched it to where the geophysical surveys have told us that might be structures and we looked particularly at this easy company other ranks building and all that's left are these concrete pads behind me and they are the the pads that held the Quonset hut with iron reinforcement rods uh, which would have held the corrugated iron sheets into position the rest of the material has been taken away. We found roofing nails and all those elements that go towards a building, like the re reinforced glass and various screws and fixtures and fittings. But fundamentally, it's, it's gone apart from the very bases of this particular building. So we know it's beneath the sports pitches. We'll cover it over, preserved for future. But the finds within this and the lines of Fox Company have been phenomenal. And they, they speak large of American presence in the six months of, the, of Easy Company here. 
It's not all fighting because there's a lot of downtime as well. So you find food tins, we found the keys of uh, spam tins, um, vile stuff, but we have found that they were surviving on these to augment maybe the, the K rations. Things like this actually speak of quite a homely element for people sat around maybe their pot-bellied stoves in the inside of these huts. That's the reed of a harmonica. So you can think of the guys playing playing uh, some music just to, just to pass the hours in between the, um, the huge amounts of training that these paratroopers did all around here. Practice bazookas, heavy machine guns, small fighting through the wood blocks, which was to serve them really well at places like Bastogne and Carantan later on. So lots of really good training going on, but here it's about surviving and downtime, except they are losing bits of their kit. Not much boy of British military here, lots of American stuff. Um, I'm sure this is familiar to many of you. Um, in the British Army, we call this a charger, but you guys call it a clip. And this is a Garand clip, and these have been throughout most of the buildings. Certainly some in the Easy Company building behind and loads in Fox Company's dwellings in the other part of the field. So in addition to that, we're finding slightly heavier munitions, such as this. There's been a few of these. This is the top of a Second World War American hand grenade. Interestingly enough, we found part of a German hand grenade dated 1944, which indicates really good training on the use of, America, of, of enemy weaponry. Um, familiarization with things like the egg grenade or the stick grenade is, is also important because if you're finding enemy weaponry, you can reuse it. There's a very famous scene when they're fighting through Brecourt and they're taking out the, the, the German gun emplacements firing onto Utah Beach. And they do so in this particular scene by uh, detonating the, the TNT with German stick grenades. And that sort of familiarity with the ability to use those uh, is developed in these fields uh, around Auburn and Salisbury Plain. Now the jump school is located in Tekoa, and I'm sure your, your knowledge of American geography is far better than mine, but that's in, in Georgia. We've managed to find a, a small token from one of the huts. It says, good for one fare. And you turn it over, it says the Howard Bus Line Inc. Through the wonders of Google and the internet, we've been able to find this is a bus token of the right period for Atlanta in Georgia. And it's a, it's a nice thought that some of the uh, individual soldiers have been given leave passes from the jump school and they've been able to make use of the bus tokens and the public transport in in the city of Atlanta um, and that gives that a real real human touch. We found a lot of American um, uniform components which I think brings you to the individual soldier um, and some of those are really quite powerful and poignant. Absolutely indisputable I think this would probably be the the find of the excavation it's a it's, a, it's an American button it's been squashed which is why it's quite flat but uh, you couldn't really be more obvious from an American service uniform than this particular item found in the huts on the lines of Fox Company. I assumed that was a coin, but that's actually a service dress It's button. a service dress button. If I turn it over, you can see uh, the eyelet has been, has been uh, squashed down. But yeah, it's a, it's a button worn up towards the collar. The story that everybody knows about the 101st Airborne and Easy Company comes from Stephen Ambrose in the television series. But I think everyone, even if they hadn't read those books, knows about the American paratroopers joining um, the very, very early hours of D-Day, dropping in on the 6th of June 1944. Um, and the paratroopers in, in particular, actually before the beach landings at Utah and Omaha beaches. And you think of them landing in the dark and trying to communicate with, with one another. And I think most people who have any interest in military history will be familiar with the film The Longest Day if they've not seen Band of Brothers and the way that the Americans communicated was with this really peculiar item which was in fact a child's toy known as a cricket or a clicker and extraordinarily enough we have found the remnants of just one of those things. This is a clicker issued for D-Day used I believe only on D-Day so this particular item is a, is a one-off. It's a link to that particular action fought by the 506th. And as an archaeologist, this is priceless because it's linking to those people on one of the most formative days of the history of, 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 of the world, frankly, in the 20th century. This is a phenomenal item. Um, it's also quite an irritating item. And I can tell you that from personal experience, every museum in the landing areas sells these clickers and if you give them to a child after two hours it loses its novelty and its amusement but nonetheless it's a really charming item and if you wanted something to scream paratrooper 
on D-Day, this is it. And I think at that point, when we when the team had found the clicker, uh, from my perspective, I thought we could we could stop now because we found the the hut of Easy Company. We found American buttons. We found Garand rounds. We found Garand clips. We found grenades. We found the clicker. We have got the story of a paratrooper on D-Day. It couldn't possibly get better, and I was wrong. Because one of our veterans in working away, you could hear a, a scream of delight. Is it, is it, it was a good scream rather than the bad scream, which was a, a positive for me. Um, suddenly shouted he'd found a dog tag and. They certainly want to play practical jokes on one another, my service servicemen, and um, I wasn't entirely convinced, but it is a genuine dog tag. This is from a chap called Richard Black. You have his service number, T4344, that's his tetanus jab, and valid for years 43 and 44. He's blood group A, and C, he's a Catholic. Um, the glories of the internet means that not only do we have all that information to hand within seconds we have a picture and that's what i love about archaeology it's about people and this little object links directly to this chap technician richard blake of the 506 parachute infantry regiment he's able company he jumps in on the morning of d-day he then comes back to the village of oldborn and then jumps into operation market garden he's a two-star jumper and at Market Garden, he has a hand wound, he loses uh, part of his middle finger, and therefore he is invalided out. That's the end of his war. He survives. And in this particular photo, he's 20. Wow. This young man, dropping in on the morning of D-Day, survives the war. He died 10 years ago, um, but we've got his dog tag in a field in Wiltshire, where Easy Company, and indeed Able Company, were living for, for those months of the war. So we've got one dog tag, and dog tags you just don't find on excavations of the Second World War. It is a, a phenomenally rare find. So when somebody tells you they found a second one, you have real grounds to feel sceptical. And the story behind this one is even more phenomenal, if that's possible. This is Karl Fenstermacher. A service number here. He's got his tetanus dated, but that's dated to 1942 to 43. So we're wondering whether it's been thrown away because it's now out of date, it's been bent. It's just a pure postulation. He's blood type O and he's got P. He's a Protestant. Now, Richard Blake was from New York State. Mr. Fenstermacher is a Pennsylvania Dutch. He's from Pennsylvania. He signs up with Forrest Goof. They're good friends, they sign up in Philadelphia, they have uh, consecutive service numbers, which is just incredible. But to prove a point, here they are. Here's Cole Fenstermaker on the left, and Forrest Goof. So we have an, one of the individuals, because he is Easy Company, that does all the same work as all the celebrated people in the television and in the book, but you may not have heard of him. Well, perhaps you should, because He's one of only two individuals I can think of from the top of my head that are three-star jumpers with an easy company, uh, Lewis Nixon being the other I can think. There's a greater side as well. Uh, in one point, his Dakota goes down into the English Channel. He's picked up by the British Royal Navy, but he's called Fenstermacher. He is a German speaker. I imagine he's probably got quite a strong German accent, and the Royal Navy seem to think he might be a German spy. So he's arrested briefly, and I'm sure it's not the case, but I can imagine him trying to persuade our Navy. Uh, he is, in fact, an American paratrooper, and he can prove it because he's got his dog tag. Except his dog tags in the field in Wiltshire. I'm sure that's not the case. However, um, he's an incredible individual. He, too, survives the war. And in the photo we've seen, he's 21 years of age. So we've got two dog tags from American servicemen from the 506, one who's 20, one who's 21. They're in this beautiful field for just a few months of their lives before the maelstrom of fighting through North Europe uh, and both survive. Now, it's an incredible story and I like to think through the excavations that we've done here not only we've we seen that the buildings do still survive admittedly in small portions um, but we've been able to add those soldiers back into the history of Oldbourne and maybe created two new brothers to add to Vander Brothers.